More than half a million Chicagoans are caught in a poverty trap, surviving on less than $8,300 a year for a family of four. Official figures put the number of unemployed Chicagoans at more than 100,000. But that figure doesn't include people so discouraged they don't even look for work anymore. This is a WSNS-TV public affairs special, Escape from the Poverty Trap, Getting Hired Today. Job training is a way out of the poverty trap for a lucky few. There are many programs available, CETA, WIN, neighborhood and private business programs, but the number of people they can serve is much less than the need. Federal funding for job training programs appears destined for oblivion. President Carter's new anti-inflation proposals call for a reduction in federal spending for job training, and many Chicago programs rely on those funds. CETA, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, provided more than 11,000 jobs for Chicagoans in fiscal 1979, but in fiscal 80, the figure is down to only 7,000. Dennis McAvoy of the Mayor's Office of Employment and Training tells us about the future of CETA jobs in Chicago. What we face in the near uh, future is a very uncertain situation, depending on what decisions Congress makes in the next few months about overall, the overall budget, and particularly about budget cuts. We do anticipate some cuts in CETA services, uh, but yet there will be a great number of positions still available to people, and still available for employers to take advantage of. Carter's proposed cuts, of course, are in response to the troubled economy. Agalise Miller, Employment Security Administrator for the Illinois Department of Labor, thinks Illinois won't see effects of a recession for some time. You mentioned that you were seeing indications of a recession. Would you elaborate? Well, of course, as you know, there, there have been uh, uh, predictions of rising unemployment for some time. Uh, in Illinois, we're very fortunate uh, unemployment tends to lag behind the experience of the nation in Illinois, primarily because of the diversified industries in the state. Take a one-industry state like Michigan, and when the automotive industry goes down, they have a serious problem. In Illinois, we have so much of so many types until usually we're feeling the recession anywhere from four to six months after we begin to perceive it in other parts of the country. Inland Steel's George Yoxel Chairman of the Board of Cabot, the Chicago Alliance of Business Employment and Training Incorporated, agrees that the coming recession will not necessarily spell disaster for Chicago. It appears that perhaps the recession has arrived. What difference do you think the recession will make with private businesses' involvement in job training programs? Well, a recession, which means uh, less total jobs, will always impact on any kind of jobs program. But we feel that our activities will continue to operate at full force because in every major recession we've had in Chicago, there's always been a shortage of people with job skills. The, uh, at the same time that you may have uh, thousands of people or even tens of thousands of people unemployed, you pick up the Sunday paper any, any Sunday and you'll see pages and pages of one ads. That's just because there's a, a lack of skilled people for many, many jobs. There's always been a shortage of secretaries. There's always been a shortage of good typists. There's a shortage of uh, practical nurses. Almost any field that requires a certain minimum of skill, there's a shortage. So that any programs that are geared to train people in skills are going to have a place even in recession periods. There was an obvious need for training programs for Chicago's unskilled and semi-skilled. However, as recession becomes a reality, a crucial question takes on even more importance. Who should provide the necessary job training programs? Business, government, or neighborhood organizations? Central to this discussion is whether people want to work at all. Jean Cartwright of Standard Oil is a member of the Mayor's Private Industry Council, a group of business, labor, education, and private community groups. PIC decides the distribution of CETA funds. Our charge is uh, pinned down probably in three things. To design programs that will meet the needs of employers. Uh, number two is to manage those programs to make sure they're effective. And the third thing is to try to minimize the bureaucratic red tape. What do you feel is the root cause 
of the unemployment problem in Chicago today? Well, there are a number of things, but the three things that uh, groups that I belong to discuss and are quite concerned about, and you've heard the first one, it's not new. That's the educational process. I feel there is a, an extreme lack of working with the high school students today in getting a skill built into that student, in getting proper educational, uh, things we take for granted, uh, reading, uh, writing, computational skills. Uh, this doesn't have the focus that we need in the school system. Something needs to be done about this. I think there's another area, uh, and that's our welfare system. I think our welfare system as presently constructed serves as a disincentive. For example, in our programs that the PIC is working with, if we're paying $3.50 an hour, uh, what does that come to on an annual basis? Uh, roughly, what, $7,000? Now, a welfare recipient is looking at, with a family of four, for example, uh, when you fold in the Medicaid or green card, the food stamps, and the age-dependent children, uh, a factor that would come close to $8,000 or more. Now, that's why I say it's a disincentive. I think that there is a tax liability that exists with the welfare system. Because in order to even out what you would get in working on that first job, you have to make more than what you're getting under welfare, because welfare payments are not taxed. There's a third area, and it's one that uh, Senator Stevenson has proposed a bill last July, which says that the minimum wage law is counterproductive to putting the youth to work. There are many small employers that would like to hire somebody under $3.10 an hour. It helps expand business when you can treat those young people who are out there available to come into the working system. Uh, this is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, I consider that also a disincentive. So it's basically, we need better training through the schools. We need to look at the welfare system as it is a disincentive and recognize some of the uh, real drawbacks uh, as it relates to going to work and the third thing is certainly the minimum wage, especially as it affects youth. Operation PUSH is the vanguard of the black movement in Chicago. Ed Riddick is the staff vice president at large. We asked him about welfare and the minimum wage. A number of statements have indicated that welfare is a disincentive to work and have in some sense attempted to correlate that to the fact that people on welfare do not want to work. As a matter of fact, they do want to work. There are some disincentives, for example, the fact that uh, three of every ten dollars that they earn would be removed uh, from their uh, checks if they worked at all. And there are some other factors that uh, serve as a disincentive, but there is every evidence that people, if they could find employment, would prefer having employment than welfare. Seems to me the minimum wage has to be sustained uh, because, among other things, there are a large number of people in uh, the public who support families on the basis of incomes that range in the area of the minimum wage or even below. Uh, in consequence, we find a vast number of people whose uh, budgets do not even meet the low standard budget of the Department of Labor's or the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, figures. We feel that minimum wage is necessary to maintain a decent, uh, at least uh, a subsistence uh, level of living. Consequently, we support the fact that there should be a minimum wage and feel that those that oppose the minimum wage um, are looking at this from a very one-sided perspective. President Carter's recently set forth his new inflation plan, and it appears that the recession is finally here. What do you think the future holds for unemployed Chicagoans? It seems to me that should present trends continue, 
uh, the budget cuts are going to affect Chicagoans in a very severe way. Already, the unemployment rate has gone up in the city of Chicago from 6 to 7 percent, which means that it is anywhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30, perhaps maybe 32 percent uh, for blacks and browns and other minorities. I think the future is very bleak for them because, as a matter of fact, if, the 19, if 1980 uh, provides a period in which there is low possibility for securing jobs, these persons are going to find themselves in the hardcore unemployed area and further and further away from the prospects of earning a living. Illinois Job Service has local offices throughout the city and suburbs. Lance Young came to the King Center Job Service office on South Cottage Grove to look for work. Lance, tell us about yourself. Um, my name is Lance Young. Uh, I have 10 years experience as a certified nurse at Aid Audley. Uh, I have been working in nursing homes. Uh, now, I guess it's very hard for me to get a job in a nursing home. Uh, I don't know why, I don't know what the reason is, but it's, it's hard to get into it. I heard my certification, and so I just got so depressed I came to the, the you know, to apply for registry for a job. And if I can't get a job soon, I have to go on welfare. And that's my only term it, you know. I filed for unemployment compensation, and they said I wasn't eligible. So I said, well, my next best step is come here and check out the program they have. So, How long have you been looking for work now? Uh, three months now. Three months, three hard months. But, uh, with good family that I have, they help me. So right now, things are just tight. But I know it's just tight for everybody. So I just do the best I can and keep a cool head. <laughs> That's all. Are you maybe looking into other job training programs? Anything. Factory, laundry, dishwashing, uh, anything that I can do to support myself, you know. And uh, it doesn't matter of the hours. You know, you tell me what time you want me to be there, hey, I'll be there. <laughs> so that's it. You know, right now, we kinda, I'm kind of like desperate. They are not the misfits. They are not the people who do not want jobs. People, the American people want to work. We are a work-oriented society. Charlotte, how long have you been looking for work? Uh, six months. And what is your previ previous job experience? Well, I was a teacher's aide for Board of Education for about five years. And then I went to Michael Reese, and I worked as an attendant for physical therapy. And after that, we all, I'm just now looking for something else now. What kind of work are you looking for? Um, basically anything that's not too strenuous for me. Some type of training program I like to get in. You're looking for a training program? Yes. Did you graduate from high school? No, I didn't. I want to get in the uh, CETA program so I can take the GED and possibly get in some type of training. Do you have young children? Yes. Is that a problem for you? Uh, Sometimes it's a problem as far as um, the type of job that I might go apply for. If I have small children, sometimes they don't want you there. They don't tell you that but I know that's the real problem. President Carter's inflation program calls for cutting back in federal funding to job training programs. What's your reaction to that? Well, it's going to make it harder for me if you really cut it back because if they start the programs, I really won't find a job then without education. So with the program, I can get something. An aspect of Carter's plan, particularly disturbing to many, is the proposed cuts in summer employment programs for young people. Unemployment in Chicago's Latino neighborhoods is 30 percent, 60 percent among youth. We visited the offices of Operation Search in Erie House on Chicago's west side and asked Latino activist Carlos Quintanilla what Carter's anti-inflation plan might mean to their neighborhood programs. Carter's plan will cut down services that are provided, such as ours. Uh, employment and training programs will be eliminated uh, in minority communities. 
uh, law enforcement action grants uh, will be also eliminated in the area of employment advocacy and social services. We feel that because of uh, the cuts in, in social service programs that Carter is planning, uh, the most affected communities will be our, ourselves. Uh, PSC, public service employment, uh, will be cut in half. Uh, that means that uh, services that are provided by Operation Search or any other organization are going to be eliminated. And therefore, there's going to be less people prepared for job readiness courses, how to fill out an application, what type of jobs are available. So what it comes down to is that there will be an ultimate increase in unemployment in our community uh, because there will be no mechanism uh, to provide the services for them. Uh, so it will definitely affect community-based organizations, social service agencies like ours. George Hanlon is Deputy Director of the Department of Human Services, a major managing agency for the Mayor's Department of Employment and Training. We asked him about possible reductions in the department's youth programs. From what I understand of it, it's been proposed by the Department of Labor that the summer youth employment program would re be reduced by 50 percent and the public service employment program would be reduced in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 percent. We've been involved with the summer youth employment program for a period of 15 years. Last year, for example, we provided opportunities for 15,000 young people to work primarily with community-based organizations. To cut that in half to 7,500 youngsters would not only reduce the opportunities of those youngsters to have a work experience, to learn something about the world of work, and to be paid for that, but would also make it very difficult for those community-based organizations to operate programs during the summer. There are those who believe the government offers useless make-work programs. John McDermott, editor and publisher of the Chicago Reporter. So what do we do with the thousands of young people who do not have special skills. Do we let them simply rot on welfare? Do we let them float around in a dependent, uh, marginal state of life? I think that's a terrible price of, to pay and a terrible waste of talent. And so make work, if make work means looking out for inventive programs uh, in the public sector to help people get a place in the economy, to help people to work, I think that's worth doing. A good education has often been a way out of the poverty trap for many. But lawyer activist Tom Todd believes that feelings about education are different today, that schools and teachers don't have a desire to educate, and students don't have a desire to learn. And he has a challenge for today's students. Uh, our children will have to understand that the machines that are so complicated now that are dealing with them uh, are going to reach a point where they can no longer operate. And we're going to have to go of necessity back to a fundamental society. And those teenagers and those kids who have prepared themselves most with the fundamentals will be the ones who will survive. And you have faith that they're strong enough to meet the challenges? I think so, and it's our responsibility uh, to show them that they have the strength. Chicago has a variety of opportunities for job training, from comprehensive programs such as those offered by the Chicago Urban League to small programs serving individual communities. When we talk about job training programs, do you think neighborhood training programs are inherently better than government programs? Well, inherently is a difficult word. I think, yes, to the extent that they are nearer to people, um, if, it, if they're well run, they are sensitive to the local realities. Uh, let us say maybe all of the young unemployed uh, men and women in a particular neighborhood might speak Spanish. A neighborhood program is much more likely to be aware of that and to be sensitive to that and to, to uh, have the bilingual capabilities so that these young people feel they're really welcome and they're understood. Um, but there are also some good citywide programs. But if you had to push me to the wall, I would say yes, in general, a neighborhood-based program and a well-run neighborhood-based program that is uh, trying to meet uh, the unemployment uh, resource, trying to look at local people as a resource, unemployed people as a resource, and, and local needs, and bring them together in housing rehabilitation, for example, or other kinds of uh, you know, renovation or improvement projects is a wonderful concept. Because we're in a curious situation in uh, inner city neighborhoods of having hundreds, thousands of 
unemployed people and who are sitting around doing very little uh, with no opportunity, waiting for the welfare check, at the same time yawning and gaping needs in the public uh, sector. Reverend Graylin Hagler is president of the New American League. Located in South Austin, the League has a goal of helping the city's 200,000 people in public housing. You do kind of the reverse from what we've come to expect. You bring the employer to the people, am I correct? Yes, we feel it's very necessary to, to bring the employer into the community. So that, for one thing, I, f I just feel that it's a much more of a secure place for the person who is going to be interviewed. And let's face it, a lot of people blow it in the interviews. If you go downtown to uh, some office, uh, sterile situation, it's, it's nervousness there. I'm, I get very nervous in, in that type of environment. And also, it's an opportunity for the employer to come out and see some of the conditions that folks are living in and, and, and can, I think, better relate to what people are saying uh, about, one thing, the need for a job, uh, the, the, the real necessity to work and feel productive. The YMCA of Metropolitan Chicago has five outreach offices in the city. Dolores Jeffrey is executive director of Manpower and Employment for their community and employment training programs. In 1979, we serviced over 2,000 individuals. We not only serviced them through employment opportunities, but referrals to training, uh, just you name it, counseling, all kinds of supportive services we have provided. We also service them through areas of referrals to other agencies if their needs call for that, if they're having personal problems of some kind. They might need some professional counseling. We also make those kinds of referrals too. If you're serving somewhere around 2,000 people a year, do you have to turn people away? We turn no one away, Linda, no one. We try to provide some kind of service or a referral for every individual that walks through our doors. If we don't have a job for them immediately, then we tell them to check back with us in a week, and we try to find a job to match that individual's skills. Or if he has no skills, then we will provide training if possible. Metro-wise CET programs are partially funded through CETA. Located in the Sun-Times building, Training Incorporated is an example of the possibilities when the public and private sectors work together to meet the needs of the community. A clerical training program of the Central YMCA Community College, Training Incorporated offers tuition-free schooling made possible through CETA funds from the Mayor's Office of Employment and Training. Contributions from private businesses, specifically Chicago United, provide a bright, pleasant office environment. Ernestine Palmer, a new student, is positive about her future. You're a new student. Your program's just begun, and we've learned that you get training in various areas. Is there a particular area that you found that appeals to you already in which you think you'd like to work? Yes, I think I would like to be an accounting clerk. I have in-depth knowledge of it now, and I think I could, I could be a very good accounting clerk. We asked Director Carol Walters what makes the Training Incorporated program so special. The fact that it is located in a business environment, we're right here in the Sun-Times building and in Chicago, right in the heart of the business community, helps the students rub shoulders with people that are already in the workforce to see themselves as a part of that. And the image for them is that they are already successful and a part of the business world just as soon as they arrive. Carol, you told me that you have a rather unique way of dealing with tardiness. Would you tell us about that? All right. We have a number of ways of dealing with tardiness. First of all, the student signs in just like they would if they were punching a clock on the job. If someone is not here by 10 after the hour, we would call them and do a workshop on why they're not here and what would help them get here, so what are the alternatives, so that they can become problem solvers. Occasionally, we also lock the door at 9 o'clock. And if you're not here, then you might go and have coffee for an hour and think about what it would take to make it on time. So that punctuality and all of the qualities that are going to make for success on the job 
are taken very seriously, and the students have a chance to think those through very well. What is your success rate? How many of your graduates get work? We're very glad to say that. It's 97% retention to graduation, and 93% or over 90% of every class lands a job at the end of the training program. There's also a retention rate of something like a little over 85 at the end of a year would still be on their job, which I think points to that the um, survival emphasis here, that once you're on the job, you have all you need to stay there and be very successful. Tony Flournoy, a recent graduate now employed by the First National Bank of Chicago, feels he was fortunate to participate in this program. I really got a feel of the field when I, when I come here for accounting. I mean, I really got familiar with it. And I know a little bit about accounting when I do decide to start my major. Do you think that the training you received here was really helpful when it came time for you to look for a job? Oh, very, very was, <laughs> because it helped me out on my resume a lot. We asked Dr. Henry Scott how Training Incorporated is funded. Well, Training Incorporated is primarily funded by the Mayor's Office of Employment and Training, Linda. But in addition to that, it's a cooperative program with the business industry. Uh, and part of the funds then come through contributions from private sector donors. For instance, this nice facility that we're in is furnished by contributions from corporate uh, agencies who are contributing to the program. How does a potential applicant go about getting considered for a Training Incorporated program? Okay. Since we work with the Mayor's Office of Employment and Training, and since it is a CETA-funded program, all of our students come through normal CETA channels. They would go to their nearby Urban Progress Center and apply if they meet CETA qualifications. And if this is the kind of program that they're interested in, that's just probably where they would end up. Would the President's anti-inflation plan affect the Training Incorporated program? Dr. Scott says they don't yet know. Chicago's job training programs serve a few of those who need them. What of the many? This is the unanswered question, and society must find the answer, especially in these times of deepening recession. We cannot afford for so many of our citizens to waste their lives in a poverty trap. Remember, Congress will be voting on President Carter's proposed budget cuts of job training programs. If you want to comment on these proposed cuts, write to Senators Percy and Stevenson and write to your representative. And what was your reaction to the Carter uh, inflation plan? I disagree with it. Why? I mean, uh, well, if we cut out the programs, uh, what, what, how can I learn, you know, a different trade? I'm trained for a, a construction worker. but. Uh, if you cut that, the program out, well, uh, if they tell me to go uh, to a factory, I couldn't do nothing, you know. If I get a job there, what could I do if I don't know, you know. Do you have a family to support? Sure. I have five kids. A wife and five kids. 